on today's episode of Motor House. Misfires, coil packs, air oil separators, vario cam solenoids. Has it done the trick? <laughs> House, and as I'm sure you've deduced from my surroundings, I'm here on board my 2002 911 996 Targa. And if you've been following the channel, you will know that I have been suffering from terrible misfire problems with this car. In fact, of all the videos I've put out, uh, this is the one that's received some of the best feedback. A lot of people wanting to know what's going on. Have I cured it? Has the misfire gone? Well, <laughs> so if you've been following the channel and if you haven't please hit subscribe now to stay update on what we're up to you will know that this car has featured in a couple of videos so far most recently we were hammering around Castle Coombe having an absolute hoot on track there and earlier on one of the very first videos I did on the channel was trying to diagnose the misfire issue that's really plagued this car now since well at least the beginning of this year it's been an absolute nightmare trying to diagnose after months of scratching our heads bruised knuckles i think we finally found the problem but for me to explain what that problem is it's probably best if i pull over and uh, i'll explain what we got up to so with all the coil packs and all the spark plugs changed, did it make a difference? Well, yes, it did. It did improve drivability. Definitely noticed an improvement. However, I was still suffering from misfires below 3000 RPM. And it wasn't even as cut and shut as that. It was, it was a very strange one, is that you could drive the car really, really hard. <laughs> and it would be absolutely fine. But as the revs drop back down in the range again, sort of low RPM, 3000 RPM, 2000 RPM and below, suddenly it'd start hesitating and then you'd wind it up in the rev band and it'd start having issues again. It was, it was most strange. So that led me to think, well, what else could be the problem? So these M96 engines that are fitted to the 996-911 and the 986 Boxster have a few well catalogued quirks and maladies. Um, one of them is an infuriating device called the air oil separator. Now, if you don't know what an air oil separator is, it's a, effectively an emissions device and it's designed to separate the mixture of air and oil hence the name, that comes up from the crankcase and push those gases back into the inlet manifold where they can be burned off. Now, unfortunately, that air oil separator can be a bit fragile. There's a big diaphragm inside and what can happen is that diaphragm can split and if the air oil separator fails really badly, then that can cause a really thick mist of oil, sometimes even neat oil going into the inlet manifold and can cause terrible issues. Now, I knew that I wasn't suffering anything that dramatic, but I did think to myself, well, you know, I do sometimes get a huge cloud of smoke on startup, which is indicative of that kind of thing. And also, what if this mist of air and oil was helping to foul the plugs at low RPM? Maybe at high RPM, there's enough air rushing through the engine to burn it off. Had to be worth a try. So with Ratchet's help, we set to changing the air oil separator. Now, to say that it was a difficult job is an understatement. That device is set right at the front of the engine, which means that it's at the top back, effectively, right near the bulkhead. Now, <laughs> the factory advice 
is to drop the engine out to change that. Um, I didn't have the facilities for doing that. Um, now, thanks to a guide on Pelican Parts, um, it did look like it was possible to change the air oil separator with the engine in situ. However, in order to do that, you have to go in through the engine hatch and disassemble all of the inlet manifold to get at it. I would liken the job as trying to paint your hallway through the letterbox. I'm super grateful that uh, Ratchet actually decided to take it upon herself to just get stuck in and get at it because she's got long arms. I, I, I haven't got long arms. And she got in there, had a go at it, I assisted, and we got the damn thing changed. So you would think, great success, right? Job done, misfire cured. Also, the pub's gonna be going what the heck? Check engine drive to workshop. Okay. Ooh. Maybe that's just, oh, 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 okay, no. We're bad again. Oh, you're bloody joking! No, um, I got a couple hundred yards down the road and the misfire was back almost immediately. Worst of all, I was now getting a really unpleasant metallic knocking sound from the bottom of the engine when it was misfiring. Things have just got a lot worse. Can you hear that? And at this point, my mind was just going to absolute worst case scenario. Have I got the de-chunking issue that can happen with these engines? Have I got terminal bore scoring? All kinds of things were going around in my head. What is going on? Have I got a bent valve? All these kind of things. The day afterwards, with a slightly more level head, um, I decided to take the decision of giving my local Porsche specialists a call. They are Zentrum over in Calverton, who have helped me out on a couple of bits and bobs in the past. And Mike, who's the main gaffer there, was super friendly on the phone. We had a chat through what was going on. I explained to him what I'd done so far, told him what the diagnostic scan was telling me, which was the fact that I was getting misfires on the driver's side bank. He didn't think it was a major issue. Well, I'm back from Zentrum and what a result. So Mike used some of the dealer level diagnostic tools that they had available to them at Zentrum and found a few error codes on mainly on this side bank of the car. And Mike's immediate thought is that it's very OCAM solenoids. So here's where the plot twist comes. I explained to Mike the whole issues, the fact that I could drive on the motorway and not have any problems except for when I slowed down. And also that bizarrely for a misfire, the harder I drove the car, the, the better it got. And Mike immediately said, sounds like you've got Variocam problems. So what is Variocam? Well, these cars um, have a variable valve timing system. It's a little bit like Porsche's version of VTEC, if you will. This being a second gen 996 has Porsche's Vario Cam Plus system. Now Vario Cam Plus uh, allows the engine to adjust both valve timing and lift. Now Mike's suggestion was that there was a fault with the Vario Cam system. Now the way the Vario Cam system works on these engines is that it has Vario Cam solenoids. Those solenoids control oil pressure through various galleries to the cam sprockets themselves, which are allowed to advance, dynamically advance the cam timing. And then which is very, very clever is the cam followers themselves are concentric followers, which will actually pump up. The centers will pump out under oil pressure and increase the valve lift. Very, very clever. And interestingly enough, you guessed it, that Variocam crossover point comes in at 3000 RPM. So what I found really fascinating was Mike plugged in some of his diagnostic stuff 
and was actually manually able to activate between the high vario cam profile and the low vario cam profile. And what absolutely amazed me is that at idle, he could switch the profiles and the engine would actually stall completely. It seems that that higher profile is so aggressive that the engine just won't run at low revs with it whatsoever. So that was quite an eye-opener. Um, so we cleared the codes, I took the car out, and wouldn't you believe it, she wouldn't play up. I had to drive around for about an hour to get it to flag a fault code, but came in and Mike went, yep, yeah, we've got a fault code, and it was mainly on that driver's side bank, at which point uh, Mike told me that he was super confident that the problem was, in fact, Variocam solenoids. So how did we fix the problem? Well, Mike's suggestion is that when you've got a problem like this, the Variocam solenoids might be sticking. Okay, they might be sticking in such a way that they either stick in the high lift or the low lift at the point where they should be either or, and it can cause all kinds of problems. And now we've got a freaking helicopter. Do you mind? I'm trying to film. So it was suggested that the problems I was having was as a result of these Variocam solenoids stuck in a position they shouldn't have been at the wrong time. And that made perfect sense. You know that metallic noise I was talking about? It was basically it. It was, it was a cam in a very, 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 very aggressive profile. So what was the fix? Well, Mike's recommendation, I'll come back to what we actually did. Mike's recommendation, which is very logical, is if you've got a similar problem, is to pull the Variocam solenoids out and label them first. That way you know what solenoid came off each bank. Then clean the solenoids with something like brake cleaner and you can activate them from 12 volts. They're just 12 volt solenoids, so you could just put a car battery on and just, just activate them in and out and just see if they are actually operating properly. Once you've taken those out, swap them bank to bank. Now, the reasoning behind that is that if you have successfully cleaned them and they're working properly, jobs are good. Un. If you have a faulty Variocam solenoid, you will then see that that misfire has swapped from one bank to the other bank. Clever, eh? So, um, is that what we did? Did we take the Variocam solenoids out? Nah. Um, so the approved advice was to pull those uh, solenoids out, give them a good clean. Did I do that? Nah, I, uh, I just decided to drive the damn thing instead. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you, four or five hundred miles on, <laughs> everything is well. I just took the decision as we were so busy with filming car prep generally just to get in the car and drive it because do you know what the more miles i put on the less this misfire became an issue and i honestly think that just putting some good hard road miles on and just just extending the engine like this it's just worked absolute wonders um I haven't had a misfire now in probably 500 miles. If I just demonstrate to you here, like this is where you classically have the problem. You can, I'll go into a taller gear. So I'm in fourth gear here. Uh, where are we? About 1500 RPM. If I put my foot down now, it just pulls and pulls and pulls and I need to lift off. <laughs> Fantastic. So what's the takeaway from all of that? Well, here's my three tips. Firstly, always work through in a logical, ordered manner. Some people take a scattergun approach to fixing issues with cars. 
And the problem is with that is that you never really know if you're changing a whole load of random stuff at a time, what's changing. You might introduce a fault that wasn't there in the first place. So start off with first basics. You've got a misfire. Start off with spark plugs. Start off with coil packs, or if you've got an older car, plug leads, distributor. You know, start off at the simple stuff. Work through. In this case, I worked through the order of spark plugs and coil packs, air oil separator, and then finally we got to Variocam solenoids. And I think I'd say that 400, 500 miles on from that, I'm reasonably confident that's the problem. Number two, don't listen to the internet doom mongers. Uh, I probably spent far too many sleepless nights thinking, oh my God, I've got terminal bore scoring, or my IMS bearing is failing, or I don't know, World War Three is breaking out in my engine bay, all of these worst case scenarios. And you know what, it's easily done, especially when you're dealing with an engine that can be as fragile and as expensive as the ones in our cars can be. Keep a level head with things. Try not to listen to the internet too much. And that, I suppose, leads me on to number three, which is never, ever be afraid to enlist a trusted professional. And by professional, I don't mean your mate Dave down the pub. I mean someone who actually does this stuff day in, day out. People, like especially so at Zentrum, will see these cars every single day. They'll have driven and worked on more of these than you and I have probably ever seen or touched and so they will see the common faults that appear on these cars after all of these years. Oh, actually, I almost forgot the most important thing. Drive your bloody cars. Cars don't like being sat around. I am absolutely confident that a lot of the problems I had here were caused by the fact that I had to park the car up for so long, thanks to COVID, thanks to all kind of reasons over winter, and the poor car was just sat outside not covered up. These are precision machines with precision machined parts and those parts need to move. They need to get lubrication, they need to get exercise for them to work properly. E eventually two bits of metal sat there will just seize together. That's how time works. So drive your car, enjoy it, don't park it away for months on end. It doesn't do it any good. Some good, light or vigorous exercise, in my opinion, is one of the best things you can possibly do with these cars. Well, that about wraps up this episode of Motor House. If you've enjoyed this one, please, you know what to do. Give us a like, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do, it helps us out so much. If you have any comments, let me know in the feedback. Let me know what you'd like to see. If there's anything on this I haven't covered, let me know, drop us a line in the comments. But for now, that's it from me, Mr. Bob, and that's it from another episode of Motorhead!